On today's episode, I'm talking all about getting your dog used to the heat so that you can prevent them from getting heat stroke in the first place. It really can kill. Then I'm moving on to how to solve the problem of stomach cramps in a dog. And then finally, how can you get a kitten to use their litter tray so that they're not making a mess all over the house? But before we get into those, here's the intro. You're listening to the Dr. Alex Answers Podcast, the show that answers all of your dog and cat health questions so they can live healthier, happier lives. And here's your host, veterinarian, Dr. Alex Avery. Hi, and welcome to episode number 15 of the Dr. Alex Answers Show. And if you're a first-time listener, then I'm Dr. Alex, the veterinarian behind ourpetshealth.com, and this is the show where I answer all of your pet health and dog and cat care questions to help you give them the care that they really deserve. I'm so happy that you've chosen to spend some time with me, and if you haven't already, then make sure that you're subscribed to the show. You can also submit your question to be featured on a future episode just by heading over to dralexanswers.com. But before we get into today's episode, I just wanted to read you this review from Rivers of Time, who writes, The only podcast that pet owners need listen to. Dr. Alex speaks enthusiastically and clearly about every topic he covers. If you're already familiar with his YouTube channel, you won't be disappointed. Equally, if you're just discovering him, him here for the first time, you should definitely check out the Our Pets Health website. There's a good chance you'll find the answer to your dog or cat's health question. So thanks for that amazing review. Really happy that you're kind of made the jump over to the podcast. I've got loads of things like the review says over on um, Our Pets health.com um, over on the website and also over on the YouTube channel so you know definitely check out the the kind of the vast back catalog in those two places and I've also got the our pets health um, podcast as well which again goes through a lot of different uh, topics maybe in more depth than I cover in these questions they kind of take a, a full approach to a, uh, a to a particular topic but you know if you also enjoy these these podcasts I'd love it if you could spare me a couple of minutes and just go to iTunes or our pets health.com slash review to leave me a review just to help other people know what they can expect when they listen to this podcast and just help them discover it to allow me to help more pets which is ultimately what this is all about and so let's jump into the first question and this question is from Lilia who asks can you get a dog used to the heat so that they build up a tolerance and so can work or perform agility when it's hot outside so the short the very short answer is yes but within reason so it's not always the actual temperature that results in heat stroke. Um, you know, and as, sim- uh, as sim- silly as that sounds, you know, the actual temperature of the outside isn't always the main problem. So what heat stroke is, is a hypothermia. So the body's body temperature rises to dangerous levels and it is definitely a potentially fatal condition. So where we can also get a danger is a sudden increase in temperature and that can actually be just as dangerous. And the classic example of this is an unseasonably warm spring day where the temperature is nowhere near as hot as it normally is in the summer, but it's an abnormal temperature for that time of year so it might have been quite cool you know there might have been a cool breeze and the sun might not have been out but then you get this glorious day where the sun comes out there's no breeze and all of a sudden it's a lot hotter than it normally is at that time of year and then it has been for the preceding days so the dog just hasn't had a chance to build up a tolerance and that's actually when we'll often see um heat stroke um hypothermia and also potentially death like I say. Now humidity also does play a role so a sudden increase in humidity as well can can mean that the the dog's ability to lose heat is also compromised Um, and you know that's because when things are humid you get less evaporation and so the dog is less able to cool itself by dumping heat through panting because panting uh, kind of requires the evaporation of the saliva which takes heat away from the body. Now if that saliva can't evaporate evaporate then you can't lose heat so it's just like us when it's really humid you get hot and sticky and that's because the sweat can't evaporate and so you can't cool down naturally and dogs are exactly the same now when temperatures do gradually increase then a dog will naturally become more used to them and so will be better able to do more when it gets hot if you are just moving into an area so if you're you know traveling for whatever reason to go to uh, an event then if you're doing that you know it's going to take a little bit of time but if you're you know maybe moving a couple of weeks uh, a couple of weeks beforehand then you can just slowly gradually increase the exercise that you're doing and a dog will gradually be able to do more and more without overheating you know having said all that though um, you know no matter how used to the heat your dog is is when the temperatures really climb, you know, in the middle of summer, if you live somewhere hot in the middle of the day, then you really need to restrict their activity to early morning 
or to evenings when it's cooler. Um, you know, no matter how well tolerated they are, if things are really hot, then they're just going to really struggle. You also should be aware of the signs of heat stroke in dogs and also know how to cool your dog down if they do start to overheat. You know, that's really important. And actually, in, in some studies, it's shown that for owners whose dogs were developing heat stroke, if they managed to take steps to cool them down before they presented to the vet um, for emergency treatment, then their chances of survival were massively increased. Now, I've got all of these details, so the signs of heat stroke, how to cool your dog down, also how to keep them cool in the first place in my free hot weather ebook, uh, which is over on the Knowledge Vault on the Our Pets Health website. You're listening to the Dr. Alex Answers Show. And actually, today's episode is brought to you by the Our Pets Health Hot Weather Dog Care ebook. So that's where I teach you to keep your dog cool, how to spot the signs of heat stroke, what to do if your dog starts overheating, as well as run through other important summer dog care tips like dangers of barbecues, some cooling treats for your dog. And you can get that all in your free copy by downloading it over at ourpetshealth.com slash summer dog care. So make sure you go over there, download that ebook, you know, get yourself educated and prevent the risk of your dog suffering from fatal hypothermia you know it's really important and it happens every year and it's definitely something that can be avoided and then my next question is from Barbara who says that she has a small mixed breed terrier who's eight years old and every now and then she has stomach or intestinal cramps she'll come back from work um, and the dog just wants to go out straight to the park will start eating grass like crazy Um, you know then she's not vomiting or having any diarrhea but she just keeps stretching her belly and she walks slowly but then after half an hour she's back to normal and she's eating her food usually now, in the past, she has had problems with Giardia and other parasites that, um, you know, that, that have been treated properly. But Barbara is worried that she might have something serious um, going on in her stomach or in her liver or in her intestines. So the first thing to say is actually Barbara getting her dog checked over to make sure that there's no pain or other problem with her in her abdomen will definitely be a good idea. So if also, if it's possible as well, also film one of these episodes because so often, you know, when we're having dogs brought into our consulting room, they just don't do what, you know, what, what they're, they're doing at home. They don't do the behaviour. And so it's very difficult to get a picture of exactly what's going on without being able to see it. You know, it's very hard to describe these things sometimes. So you know, just taking your your phone out when she's having one of these episodes, recording it can be really important, and it can definitely make a decision, uh, make a difference when it comes to um the speed at which a diagnosis can be made or which tests are run. Um, you know, and it can so so it can help save time, but it can also save money, so that you're not having um tests that are actually um unnecessary being run. So film something if you can. Um, now, if you do have your dog checked over and everything is normal, then there could be a number of different causes. And that could be something like a mild pancreatitis. So the pancreas um, is up kind of by the stomach or close to the stomach at the top, kind of the, the front end of the, the abdomen. Um, and also a kind of a mild pancreatitis. So we get pain in that front end of the abdomen, but we also often will get dogs stretching out. So the classic prayer position is what we call it. And it's where their their bum is in the air, their back legs are kind of straight, and then they're crouching down so that their head and their chest are on the ground and their front legs are stretching forward. So that's, um, you know, really just a sign of, of abdominal pain, but it's something that we'll often get with, with a pancreatitis. Now, pancreatitis can vary from just being a mild, grumbling kind of chronic pancreatitis where that discomfort is pretty much the only thing that's going on but you can get more severe um, and ultimately life-threatening acute pancreatitis but in that case the dog would be you know very unwell now there might also be something like inflammatory bowel disease or a dietary sensitivity where the lining of the intestines just getting a little bit inflamed and so that's causing problems there um, or absolutely it could even be something slowly growing in her abdomen so that you know, we're thinking really of tumours here. Now, they're not always able to be felt when um, when a vet is feeling the, the belly. It depends on how, you know, tense the abdomen is, where the mass is, what size it is, um, all that kinds of things. Now, most likely there's nothing serious. Um, and that means that there are several options going forward, you know, really depending, of course, on what your vet suggests and what the examination findings are and, you know, any other history maybe for for this wee terrier. So you could potentially try and switch to a hypoallergenic diet. So just a nice, bland, easily digestible diet that's designed for intestinal up- upsets and, um, you know, potentially allergies or food um, dietary insensitivities, you know, and just see if that change in diet helps. 
Now, whenever we change diet, it can, well, sometimes we'll get a, 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 an improvement very quickly, but sometimes it can take a number of months before we see the full benefit of that diet. So, you know, you're gonna if you're going to change diet, then really continue to feed that for a few months before giving up if the attacks are continuing. Now, another strategy to take place and would be the safest option would be to run a screening blood test for some of the things that I've discussed certainly um, you can get blood tests that would rule out or make pancreatitis very very unlikely um, and then depending on those results you can also have a screening ultrasound so that would be useful to have a little look at the lining of the intestines to see if there's any inflammation there which may be an indication that we're dealing with an inflammatory bowel disease um, and also it's going to show you if there's anything growing so if there is a mass in the liver or the spleen or the stomach or something like that so that's something else to to think about as well now like I say I suspect that there's nothing too serious behind what's being described but there's no way that I can say that for sure. And also, it's clearly causing a problem to this wee terrier. It's causing some distress. It's causing some discomfort. And so getting a checked over and then discussing the options with your vet is definitely going to be the best idea. Because if there is actually something going on and there's a good treatment that we can be given, well, if we get onto it early, we're more likely to to to, to get a, a diagnosis that is um, you know actionable and that we can do something about. So sometimes with some conditions, if we leave things too late, then you know, even if we make that diagnosis, the treatment that we give will not have the best effect. Um, and also, if it's nothing, then we've got peace of mind um, that there's nothing more that we need to be doing or nothing serious we need to be treating. And we can then maybe take some of these longer term management steps to try and reduce these periods of discomfort. And then now's the time in the podcast where I remind you that the information that I give in these episodes is not a substitute for a consultation and examination with your pet's veterinarian and should not be taken as specific advice for any individual pet. You know, if your pet is unwell, if they're injured or if they're suffering from any kind of problem, then talking to your vet is always going to be the best course of action. Get your question answered at dralexanswers.com. And then my final question today is from Caleb, who says, Hello, I've got two little kittens, and despite everything I try, I seem not to get one of them to pee in the box. I have caught her about to pee before, and I picked her up and put her in the litter tray. Um, she seems to go to the box just to poop, but not to pee. Um, I also think that she's stressed because she always runs away from us, but then other times she'll um, she'll come up and play with us um, and get up on our lap and let us pet her. So, you know, the bottom line is, is how can we litter train this kitten to use the litter tray for peeing as well as pooing, you know, and does stress play a role? And what can we do about that potential stress? Kittens actually have a natural urge to go to the toilet somewhere where they can cover up their waste. And so actually often will take very little training, you know, certainly compared to dogs who can sometimes be quite challenging or it can take quite a long time to, to house train them, to toilet train them there. So when we're thinking about kittens, though, there's a number of things that we can think about. The first thing is what tray are we using? So it needs to be a tray that's easy for this little kitten to get into. To. you know I'm not sure how old they are but you know if they're small and we've got a, a, a litter tray with a high lip then it can be actually very difficult for them to get into that and that will put them off unless they're you know really motivated because they're going to do a poo um, so make sure the lip's not too high use a shallow litter tray um, also place a puppy pad underneath the tray which will just allow you to clean it up much more easily if you miss the tray and don't use a really tiny tray as well because it's more likely that your little kitten is going to miss it so use a big tray um, with low sides next up we need to think of litter. Um, so some cats are really fussy over the type of litter that they that they use. So really to start off with, try a non-scented and a non-clumping litter um, just to make it more likely that your cat will accept it. Um, you know, cats are very sensitive with their smell um, and yeah, some of these um, you know, kind of scented uh, litters are going to really put them off. Also, if they're a clumping litter and they kind of when they're trying to to cover their um, their pee or their poop, then it will become clumped and stick to the bottom of their feet, which cats really don't like. Um, another thing to think about, certainly if you've got very young kittens, is the the litter does need to be non toxic because they will potentially you know try and eat a little bit of it. So we don't want anything that's toxic if it's eaten by a kitten. Okay, and then the third thing we need to think about is location. So where are we putting these litter? trays so really it should be away from food and water sources so cats really do like to be clean um, and they like to toilet away from where they're eating and drinking so make sure that's the case also it needs to be a private space so don't put it you know in the middle of the hall or by the front door because you know that's not private and a cat will be less likely to use it Keeping the kittens in one room with easy access to the tray is another thing that we can think about to just get them used to it to start with, you know, and also that means that they're not going to get caught short. So young kittens might 
not yet have a full bladder control. And so they're more likely to have accidents or they're more likely to realise they need to use the toilet and then go pretty much straight away. Now, if they've got kind of half the house, a couple of stair- flights of stairs to, to navigate, then the chances are that they're not going to get there in time. Um, you know, compare that to going to going for a poop, um, you know, when that urge is often, you know, less initially. So, yeah, that's what kind of what we can think about. Just get them used to the tray. As for where we place it, well, like I say, it needs to be a private space. And actually, corners of rooms are a really good place to go. So kittens will often naturally go to the toilet in the corner of the room. Um, And one of the reasons for this is that it means that they can survey, they can look out at the rest of the room, and there's no chance of kind of being ambushed of a litter mate or another cat kind of sneaking up on them and ambushing them, you know, while they're potentially a little bit vulnerable and going to the toilet. So, you know, that's important as well when we're thinking of litter tray placement. Now, fourth up, we need to think of keeping the litter tray clean. Now, that obviously goes without saying, um, you know, we need to keep it clean. We need to regularly refresh the litter. Um, I'd certainly be cleaning out at least once a day but some cats they just won't use a tray that's been used just once even just for a little tiny bit of pee um so you know keeping that litter tray clean is really important also um you know think about what you're cleaning it out with you want to clean it out with a disinfectant but then rinse it really well so there's no kind of strong smells um no strong fragrances that again may put your cat off so yeah clean it by all means with you know whatever cleaner you want to use but rinse it really well with water and then the final thing we think need to think about when we're thinking of litter trays with multi-cat households in general is how many litter trays you have and really there need to be one more than the number of cats there are in the house so in this case if there are two kittens there may be other cats but let's say there are two kittens in the house where we need three trays now if there were three cats so two kittens and another cat already there then that's three cats we need four trays and the same goes for the number of food bowls and water stations as well so all of those things should get your cat and your kitten using their litter tray and get them litter trained Now, the other part of the question was we think that this little kitten is stressed and what can we do about that? Well, you know, absolutely stress can cause spraying. It can cause marking behavior. And there are a number of things that we can do. So we can, you know, discuss, I've already discussed the number of trays and food stations and water stations that we need, you know, new to them depending on their age. You know, that has a big impact on on if they're spraying, certainly, and if they're exhibiting marking behavior. We need safe spaces for our cats, you know, so they can always go and hide somewhere if they're feeling threatened and also we need 3d spaces so cats are really three-dimensional in their outlook so they do like to to get up high on the tops of shelves on tops of cupboards um you know all different places like that so make sure that there's a, a safe space and 3d spaces as well um fell away is another thing that we can do so this is a, a pheromone and i talk about this a lot when it comes to stress in cats um it just naturally makes them feel more at home makes them feel like that's their safe space and really reduce their stress levels and actually if you head over to the knowledge vault over at dralexanswers.com there is a free free guide uh, sorry there is a free guide to stress there in cats so kind of recognizing that your cat is stressed the signs that they're stressed and also how to go about dealing with that de-stressing and relaxing them as well so you know both of those things are very important when it comes to getting a cat to urinate in their tray rather than spraying around the rest of the house i suspect that that's not the case with this kitten and really it's just a case of getting them used to the litter tray Um, but you know definitely check out that guide too Right, so that's it for this episode of the podcast. Be sure to subscribe. And if you do have a spare couple of minutes, I'd love it if you could leave me a review over on iTunes or wherever it is that you're listening to this podcast, whichever app you're using, or over at rpetshealth.com slash review, just to help more people discover this podcast, help them know what to expect, um, make sure that it's worth their while, and also allow me to help more pets, which is really what this is all about. Remember too to head over to dralexanswers.com where you'll find the links and the downloads mentioned in today's show. And And until next time, take care. You've been listening to the Dr. Alex Answers Podcast. Be sure to rate, review, subscribe, and we'll see you on the next episode of the show where you ask the questions and Dr. Alex answers.